Good evening, folks. Good evening. This is a special meeting of the Planning Board of the Township of Middletown, pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act and laws of 1975. The public has been notified that the Planning Board will meet on August 13, 2018, at 6.30 p.m. in the Town Hall. The Middletown Planning Board has notified the Independent, the Star Ledger, and the Two River Times on August 9, 2018. Notice of this meeting was filed with the Township Clerk and posted in the Town Hall on August 9, 2018. All notification for this meeting was given pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act at least 48 hours prior to this meeting. Can you stand up the place? I pledge Marshall Lessie, planner, 
uh, who's been retained to do a consistency review. Um, so to bring this to the non-agenda item, we did submit comments uh, this, this afternoon. Uh, it's a very short turnaround. We had 48 hour notice of this meeting, but we've got comments in. Questions that the board have been received? Uh, the board all has got it, but the board does not. The board does not. We do have copies. I would like to furnish those uh, to the members. Okay. This is going to go on, so let me, let me cut the chance. I'm going to read from uh, Mr. Coxon's handbook on zoning, page 152 of the most recent edition of 2018. Let me just read from that. The question is sometimes been raised as to whether the planning board is obliged to hold the amount to be a public hearing considering an ordinance referred to the Department of Government Bodies. Clearly, the statute does not require such a hearing, nor does it require that the matter be open to the public to comment. All deliberations by the board, of course, must be in public to comply with the open public meeting act. But it is within the discretion of the board whether to hear from members of the public on the matter. It also goes on to say the case of Malcolm Realty versus Malcolm from 1985, the Supreme Court case talking about when a matter is reviewed uh, by the planning board to see if it's in substantial compliance with the ordinance. Uh, I was involved in that case from an applicant on the winning end, so I think I know what the ordinance is on this issue. Here's my advice. Once we're not, the board is not required. Once you go beyond the point where you're not required to, and now we're in a discretionary category, there's no rules to govern. There's no rules to say what we can and can't do. And I think at that point, we need to in a situation where it's never going to be enough, it's never enough cross-examination, it's not this and it's not that. So um, my advice is rely upon what the law says you must do. We do that. And the rest of it is too discretionary. There's, there's too many things that somebody might argue we didn't do it right, even though we didn't have to do it at all. And I don't want to wind up in that type of argument about you know, cutting people off, it wasn't, cross that, it wasn't enough cross-examination, or their planner said this, or our planner said that, and there's, there's no reason to build a record. The record for this matter is before the governing body. On next Monday, Monday, the 20th, at 8, that's when the public hearing on this matter occurs. At that point, the governing body takes testimony, hears from the public, and conducts that meeting as it deems appropriate, but with required public participation. It's not required for tonight. Um, yes, the board could do that, but it's my recommendation that you do not. Because there's no, there's no limit on where it is. There's no limit on the debate. There's no limit on what's in, what's out, what's relevant, what's not relevant. And this is not required. And my, rec my recommendation is that we don't do it. Mr. Provence, do you want to make yeah, yes. if I may, if I, uh, first of all, just again to reiterate the situation, residents who care a lot about this project went and retained a plan to for the specific issue of whether this plan is consistent with the master plan. She has prepared comments. She is here to offer testimony. Okay, that's the that's the. I will make the, I will make the decision on that. Make the I will read my tutorial, okay. and I will make the decision on that. And then the second point I'd like to say is that sometimes in life, there's what you can do and what you should do. You don't have to run for a planning board, but your town needs you, so you sit there and you, and you do good things for the town. What we're requesting is that this is the residents regarding this specific issue, because next Monday if you get there, you know, they'll make the comments to the council, but it's a different issue with that. Sir? I've been a vice chairman for 24 years on the planning board. I'm 75 years old. I think I know what I'm going to be doing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is going to be my recommendation that that's the equivalent of putting testimony in before the board. It shouldn't be considered. The board shouldn't. Doesn't have to have that. Doesn't need that. And that just submit that, does that mean that the developers pop up and say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, that's it, they want more. No, they haven't had a chance to read it, they don't know what's going on. This is not fair. You're saying, if the board makes a determination not to allow public comment, what you're saying is, but here, take this document instead, in lieu of public comment, here's a report. It, it, I leave that to the board, but it's my recommendation that there be no public comment, whether written 
or at this meeting. The place for it is at the governing body, indeed, even on the Facebook page or the ad, whatever it says, within Stop Bill is 35. The planning board does not have to allow um, public comment at this meeting. So if to say that people thought it was going to be, no, that's what you, we talked on the phone numerous times. So I don't think this should come as a surprise. The planning board does not have to receive public comment at this meeting. Yes, and you're very clear about that. I understand it, but it's still discretionary. And so the question it is, is, it is discretionary. Should you? It's discretionary. And once again, we it's discretionary. Yes. So I still haven't heard an answer as to whether uh, A would be able to participate on that, B whether we'd be able to ask questions of, uh, on the, the presentation uh, and or of the, the planner who presumably has prepared a report on consistency, we did request a copy of that, but have not been furnished uh, with such a document. You haven't been furnished with it because the player, the report from our planner is deliberative and consultative, draft until such time as it's discussed in public by the board. So that hasn't happened. It will probably happen tonight, and then that document will be subject to be released, subject to the So the document that's is required by the board to make a statutory determination, you're saying it's not available to the public until after the determination has been made? Well, that seems frankly backwards. Thank you. Doesn't the, Thank you. Why Thank you for your comments. I'm not arguing any further. Okay. I'm not arguing either. I'd like a copy of the document. May I have a copy of that document? <coughs> well, that document becomes a public document once it's relied upon. Right? I assume that would be relatively soon because I haven't gotten to it yet on the agenda. But at some point, once it's discussed on the board, it's a public document. We haven't really cleared it. We're not there. Uh. I mean, I think I presume that that's going to happen fairly soon, but we're not there. Well, I haven't been relied on the document in preparation for this meeting. So Mr. Mr. Burns, please. Part of the packet, right? That's enough. You can note it. Thank you. Into consideration what you said. Okay. So thank you. Request that further be recognized. I request uh, that you stand down, sir. During the thank you. presentation. Thank you. Well, thank thank you. you. Well, clearly, Mr. Provence is here. He's identified his clients. They're here. It's a public meeting. You have every right to, to listen. So go out and participate. Well, that, 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 unless you can show me a case which says they have to do it, then I think that matters. I, I, my advice to the board has been fairly clear and then you can start giving them advice. Okay. Uh, I'm not giving them advice. I think we've all. I think we've this. What are you so arrogant about? I'm not arrogant. Yes, you are. I am not arrogant, excuse you me. Are. Look. You are arrogant. I am not arrogant. of this town. I, have read, I will be reading a tutorial on what actually is going on at this meeting. Right. And when I'm done with that, then we're going to proceed. And the decision as to whether or not the public can participate, in my opinion, is at the prerogative of the chair with the advice and consent, basically, of the board. And if anybody on the board wants to disagree with whatever the chair finds, then say it. It will be in the debate that wants to support it. But the prerogative to run the meeting is in the chair. For the record, I would like to say that I would like to see public comment on this issue. Thank you. jumped ahead. This item on the agenda is thing not on the agenda. The right. last thing I looked, this is on the agenda. My correspondence is not on the agenda. I, I think they're splitting hairs. Let the force finish its regular business before we get to this. Fine. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm Okay, payment of vouchers for this month. James Gorman, total of four thousand five hundred thirty-seven and ten. For Team and Associates, eighteen thousand one thirty-eight thirty-eight. For the Planning Board, one thousand five sixty-one seventy-five. Total twenty-four thousand two hundred 
$237.23. May I have a approval? So moved. Have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Two things I, which is not listed on the uh, itinerary this evening. Uh, we have Kevin Colangio and Anthony Fiore uh, are back on the planning board. Uh, of course, uh, Anthony's been on here before, but Kevin is new. And uh, I see we have uh, been just approved. And thank you for coming on to the planning board. I think Kevin actually became the new mayor designated. The new mayor designated. The new mayor designated just like the old mayor designated. Also, I would like to uh, say something about Greta Swizek, who retired, who were, uh, retired from the board last month. Uh, we wanted to thank her for her service, and she was a tremendous member uh, for the planning board for the past uh, almost eight years. Uh, we wish Greta well, and uh, I know she will be doing a lot of service, continued service in the North Middletown uh, Bayshore area. We thank Greta again. <laughs> this meeting is tough. I realize that. We have a lot of things going on. I'm just going to read a short tutorial that is a breakdown of what we're actually... I'm not going to put all legalese behind it, but I'm going to show you where we are at this point. There are a number of steps required by state statute to declare an area in need of development. One of the steps, the first step, is the governing body of a municipality passes a resolution directing the planning board to undertake a preliminary investigation to determine if the area in question is in need of redevelopment. And it's identified, we, we identify the limits of the project at that time. This was started on September 18, 2017. The planning board, or consultants, which we have now, conducts an investigation and holds a public hearing on the proposed redevelopment area. The investigation is a land use study to determine if the area is in need of redevelopment in accordance with the statutory criteria. Public notice is required. This initially was presented on 12-6, December 6, 2017. Based on the planning board recommendation, the governing body may designate by resolution all or portion of the area as an area in need of redevelopment. Important, no public hearing is required for this portion of the process. Fourth step, the governing body prepares a redevelopment plan for the area or directs the planning board to prepare the plan. This can be done in-house or by a consultant. We have used a consultant. The governing body adopts by ordinance the redevelopment plan. This was adopted July 18, 2018. It's in, the ordinance is introduced, referred to the planning board for a consistency review. The planning board reviews it to determine whether the provisions of the redevelopment plan are consistent with the municipal master plan or design or designed to effectuate the purpose of the master plan. The planning board prepares a report noting their findings to the governing body. Planning board's role is not to review the merits of the plan. It is only to to just go and check the consistency with the master plan. The governing body is, is at the second reading. The second reading is going to be on Monday, August 20th at 8 p.m. with the Township Committee. At this time, at that step, a public hearing is held and all questions are given to the Township Committee. The governing body oversees the implementation of this redevelopment plan. The redevelopment entity or agency selects a redeveloper to undertake the redevelopment project or projects that implement the plan. The governing body enters into a redevelopment agreement with the redeveloper wherein details such as agreements 
regarding stormwater management, uh, stormwater management facility, uh, roadway improvements, and other things are stipulated. The redeveloper makes an application to the planning board for a site plan review. Now question, when are you folks going to speak to the planning board about this Route 35 Service Lakers development? You will more than likely speak to us at the site plan review, which may come in January, February, I do not know. That is again according to what the site developer uh, what the site developer uh, presents. But that is what I'm trying to tell you folks. The questions you have for this ordinance should be going to the council itself, the committee itself. Any other questions? I should have very reiterated into that. At this time then I would like to uh, present our study and uh, Mayor, Mayor, yes. your presentation, sir, and your name matters. We're not right. Well, you're not good at you're not good at it. You have done at least one in us. But yes, Mr. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you very much. My name is Francis Ryder. I'm a landscape architect and professional planner in the state of New Jersey. Uh, I've been working with uh, DMR Architects and have uh, been, been a, a partner there for about 10 years now. I uh, appreciate the opportunity this evening to present to you the uh, redevelopment plan for what we're calling the Circus Liquors properties. Uh, you can see uh, the block and lots that are identified on, on this slide. What I'm going to do is you shall have a report here. Uh, this report is the full detail of information. I'm going to give you a presentation that outlines what I believe are the most critical and important pieces. On uh, occasion, I will, I will um, state a page number just as a reference for you. Uh, but I'm not going to go through every single line. I'm really going to do is try to hit the highlights of what this redevelopment plan is about um, and all of the work that we put together to ensure that uh, a high quality project is, is developed ultimately. Originally, as you mentioned, the, the uh, township had uh, done an investigation study, and I just wanted to kind of outline in terms of the, the properties that were reviewed in terms of meeting the statutory criteria as an area of need of redevelopment. The red represents those properties that uh, were presented to the board, ultimately were recommended to the mayor council uh, as, as areas that met the criteria for an area of need of redevelopment. The yellow properties in our opinion did not, and so just, just in terms of where the redevelopment plan is and, and, and what it uh, constitutes, it's, it's the red identified on this map. I'm going to perhaps uh, make a couple statements that you've already made, but I think it's important because, because the redevelopment plan process is not always one that, that is easy to uh, understand. So essentially, a redevelopment plan represents uh, new zone. In this particular case, uh, the vast majority of the zoning would be an overlay to the underlying PD zone, meaning that the PD zone, is, uh, which is the current zone, is still applicable uh, even if this plan would be adopted. So some of the reasons why you, use a re you, you do the redevelopment plan is that it gives you greater control in terms of the types of design, design standards, that are required of the development than just typical zoning. Uh, a PD zone would give you the bulk standards, but it might not provide you with as much landscape design standards, uh, stormwater drainage standards. A redevelopment plan allows you to go much greater in depth in terms of the requirements which are placed upon the developer ultimately. And so a redevelopment plan ensures and secures that you're going to get a higher quality development than what you would typically get are just zoning. Excuse me. So are you saying typically with the redevelopment plan, it gives the capability for the township officials or the township committee to specify a level of zoning requirements that typically go beyond what you see in zoning requirements? I would agree with that statement, yes. Including landscaping and other elements that typically 
uh, developers have more freedom to execute? Yes, that, that the current that zoning typically does not require. And so I'm going to walk through many of those in my presentation and then I'm going to refer to some of them in the document. But you will see as we go through this that we have placed on the, the property far greater standards than you would typically get under normal zoning or typical zoning. Uh, and we'll, I'll kind of highlight those as we go through. That doesn't then, in a sense, restrict which developers may be interested in the property? The, the goal and the objective of a redevelopment plan should be to promote what is in the best interest of the municipality and not in the best interest of the developer. And so there are. I realize that, but it still restricts, it restricts which developers may be wanting to pursue the project. Mr. Davis, I think what you're alluding to. Well, I'm not asking your opinion. Yeah, Mr. Davis, that, as a governing body official, planning board, okay, that, that, that you know, will ultimately uh, knows in rules on zoning, I would tell you that what you're saying is, and what Mr. Reiner said now twice, which unfortunately maybe you may or may not be comprehending, is that. <laughs> Well, Mr. Davis, he's answered your question twice. Sure, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just be quiet while I answer. Tell me to be quiet, Mr. Davis. new zoning or, or zoning that was was not uh, in line with the underlying zoning, then I would answer the question that you asked is yes, it does limit it. But given that the, the redevelopment plan for, for most of the, um, of the requirements of the underlying zoning is very similar, what we're really doing here is, is ensuring higher quality design as opposed to changing the uses which would limit the developers that would be interested. That's how I would answer it. Now in this situation, Developer, does a developer have a choice to either go through the redevelopment process or go through the PD zone uh, general development process? Yeah, yes. Uh, I'd like to break in here. What we usually do in our meetings, and I, I think most of the members know that we, we can ask uh, our engineer comments once he once he actually shows his whole uh, shows his whole uh, uh, plan. Let's write down what comments you wish to say, but let's let him, I would say let him run through it first. Because it's it's a lengthy it's a lengthy uh, procedure here and I would like to be able to save the comments for the end of the end of his uh, his uh, speech pertaining to the plan. Okay, proceed. So in addition, uh, what we've outlined here is is that there are design standards for business document for our, from a neighborhood standpoint architectural, landscape architectural, sustainability, and use of both. Uh, in addition, as you mentioned, part of this process would be then to ultimately designate a developer and, and, and enter into a redeveloper's agreement, uh, which would set forth the, the performance standards. As I mentioned, the properties of Oregon uh, designated as an area need of redevelopment without condemnation. Uh, in the report that you have in front of you on page 37, it, it outlines the consistency of this plan with, with the uh, Township Master Plan 2004, the 2009 Amended Master Plan, the 2014 Reexamination Report, and the State Development and Redevelopment Plan. So from page 37 and beyond, it, it talks about consistency. It's important to note that, that these things are not done in vacuums, that they're intended to be done uh, with a consistent pattern of, of 
what is being uh, proposed within the municipality over time. And so we've gone through that uh, as part of the document. As I mentioned, the plan represents the zoning. Uh, it's really broken into two districts. And so uh, I know the lettering is small, so I'm going to uh, uh, allude to it so the public can see it as well. The two districts are the commercial track, and that would be the track closest to 35. So looking at this image, it would be uh, the, the, where the blue writing is. So the left of that image represents the commercial track, and the residential track represents uh, to the right of the image. And so the, there are two distinct districts and the zoning that we've placed into this and the requirements we've placed in this are based on those two tracks. As the chairman mentioned, this is a multi-step process. The first step was the investigation study. We presented that to the board. Uh, it was recommended that the properties that we had identified be designated as an area of redevelopment. This, of course, is the second uh, step in the process, and this would be the redevelopment plan. And then the subsequent step, which is, which is the step really where a lot of the questions come in is the site plan application. So after a developer is designated, the developer then puts together a site plan application. That site plan application comes before the board. Uh, the public has an opportunity to comment on that site plan application. And the developer at that point has to provide a significant amount of information pertaining to things like stormwater management, traffic, all of those components that are, that are really the basis of the plan. What we're doing here tonight is really just zoning terms of what is permitted. There's a long-standing history in this property. Uh, I understand that, and I know that I have not been involved with all of it, but I think it's important uh, to kind of walk through that uh, for both the board's uh, knowledge and also for the public. Uh, as in 1994, let's start with 1992, the New Jersey designated this site uh, as a future regional center for dense mixed use redevelopment. Uh, in 1994, the township implemented zoning that would allow for dense mixed-use development uh, while, it's, while aggressively pr uh, preserving other portions of the township as open space. That 1994, uh, which is identified as the town center plan above, permitted up to 1.7 million square foot of commercial square footage and additional 425 residential units, 400 of the market rate, and 25 of the affordable. In 2000, the state renewed the state plan keeping the site designated for dense mixed-use redevelopment. In 2001, the township attempted to downzone the property, uh, which was thrown out by the courts. In 2003 and 2004, the township rezoned the property to try to promote more residential development. Uh, these efforts were again overturned by the courts. In 2008, the township lost a lawsuit allowing the developer to legally proceed with the town center. Originally envisioned for 19, in 1994, again with 1.7 million square feet and 425 units. In 2009, the township agreed to settle, uh, and the 2009 settlement included 610,000 square foot of retail and a total of 504 residential units, 424 of them market rate and 80 of them affordable. The redevelopment plan that we're presenting to you this evening uh, has a requirement of a maximum of 400,000 square foot of commercial space, uh, a maximum of 400 residential units, which would include a minimum of 20% of the units being affordable or 80 units. So 320 market rate and 80 uh, affordable. Again, I have not been involved with the whole history of the site, but I understand that there is a lot uh, to that. I thought it was important to kind of relay um, a little bit of the history and where we've come from where you've come from to where we are uh, this evening. Again, uh, there are a significant amount of, of gross track. So the gross track would be both of them. So you can see the commercial track on the left, the residential track on the right. There are uh, permitted and accessory uses that are, that are a part of the, uh, the gross track requirements. As I mentioned, the PD zone is the underlying zone. That's the existing zone right now. Uh, there are stormwater management facility requirements, there are roadway connectivity requirements, and there are open space regulations. We'll go through all of those kind of individually by the, by the district. As I mentioned, there are two districts, there's a commercial track and a residential track, but it's important to note that there are sub-districts. So the commercial track includes what is known as the North Retail District, which is identified in the purple at the corner at, uh, at uh, U35 at Kings Highway East. 
and the core district is the red, which is really the rest of the property down to King's Lane. The residential track is broken also into two uh, sub-districts, uh, one of them being the townhouse district, which is the purple. The public might not see that color, so that everything outside of the yellow. Uh, and then the multifamily district, which is the affordable housing component in the yellow portion. Some of the gross track uh, requirements that we identified uh, that, that I'm calling out here as, as being maybe um, high level importance. Again, all of them are actually identified within the report that you have. But just to kind of go through some of the important ones we think uh, talk to the, to, the, uh, to the quality of the, of the development. In terms of the permitted accessory uses, uh, fast food drive throughs are prohibited part of the, um, the redevelopment plan. Accessory drive throughs for pharmacies, banks, and supermarkets would be permitted. Uh, I know that has been a point of contention by a, a number of different people. We wanted to make sure that we at least noted it uh, for this evening's presentation. The stormwater management facilities uh, are intended to serve the entire development and can be located within either the residential or the commercial track. Uh, in the roadway connectivity, there is an interconnect road that will be between the residential and the commercial track. Uh, and we have requirements for that particular road, which will ultimately be a public street. And then in terms of the open space requirements, the gross track, meaning both the residential and the commercial combined, has a minimum requirement of 30%, and of that, 25% has to be uh, within the commercial track. So now I'm gonna walk through uh, with you each one of the areas, and again, these are located within the document, uh, starting on page 12. I think it's important also as I go through this, I will note of these requirements, which ones of them are actually uh, already the PD zone, the underlying PD zone. So in terms of permitted uses, all the existing, now we're talking about the North Retail District, which is the, the purple, uh, identified as the purple. The existing uses are permitted. Uh, Non-residential uses in the gross track are permitted, and stormwater management facilities are permitted. On the, on the bottom, you see what is essentially a conceptual site plan. I don't want to get caught up on the site plan because this is zoning, but, but what you want to do is you want to understand what the zoning would look like physically. So we have the, we have the concept plan uh, on the bottom right, and you can see in that particular area, now it's oriented to the side. So just for the board's education, the North Retail District is located, is located right here. So the only identifiable uses on that property at the moment are the existing Wells Fargo Bank and stormwater facility. Uh, so a, a stormwater detention basin. There's no other uses that are proposed. So bulk standards, bulk standards are uh, minimum lot size of an acre. The building setback for what would be a new road alignment Currently, Kings Highway East goes to the left of the area at this point. It would actually cut through and connect in with the loop. So the setback along Twin Brooks would be 50 foot. The setback uh, uh, for the gross track boundary would be 50 foot. Any building setback uh, from an internal property line would be 15 foot. The building height would be four stories and 60 feet. And I know that becomes a point of contention, so I want to just want to make sure everybody understands that the four stories, 60 feet is currently permitted in the PD zone. So we're not allowing extra height or extra stories in this redevelopment plan. And since this is an overlay zone, the developer could always go back and use this, the zone standards for the PD zone. So it means that what we're simply doing is we're taking the, the permitted height and stories and we're simply transferring as a part of this redevelopment plan. Um, the intention here is not to build the concept plan is not to build uh, four-story buildings. It's simply allowing the developer what is already permitted within the PD zone. Uh, the parking requirement standards uh, in terms of setbacks are 25 foot along the gross track. Uh, internal property line is 10 foot and along buildings is 6 foot. For the uh, core district, and that is uh, page 12 and 13, Again, the existing uses of the PD zone, again, stormwater management uh, facilities are uh, also permitted. The bulk standards in terms of setbacks 
are either either meet the existing PD or are in excess of the existing PD. So we're we're making uh, a situation of existing PD zone, and we're providing greater setback requirements from the developer, meaning that the proximity to existing uh, developments or existing buildings outside of this development, we are making a better situation than is currently permitted under the PD zone. And so the building setbacks would be 35 foot along uh, Keynes Highway East, it would be a minimum of 75 foot along uh, or adjacent to any single family residential zone, it would be 150 feet. And the building height I've, I've already kind of talked to you about in terms of what is permitted in the PD zone. The parking standards uh, for out parcels would be uh, five feet. There are a couple of out parcels which are uh, adjacent to uh, Route 35. If you look at the red on the upper image, there are two kind of cut out areas along uh, Route 35. Those are, are what are designated as out parcels. The other requirements that I have not put in this report in this presentation, but are, are in the report, I just I wanted to uh, at least note a couple that I thought were important. Some of the landscape design standards. When you typically uh, are looking at this type of development, you, you may just have a situation where a developer would typically want to come in and just build a large asphalt parking lot. And so the requirements that we have placed on this uh, particular uh, commercial track is that the parking lots have to be divided up into, into lots of approximately 275 spaces that are separated by an elevated or large <coughs> or hardscape strip to a minimum of 12 foot. So what you're going to get is, is you're going to get smaller areas of parking with landscape buffering between those areas, uh, which we believe uh, obviously provides a much higher quality than uh, simply an asphalt or sea of, of parking as, as, uh, some, uh, as, some, as you may see in some types of developments in this, of this character. In addition, we are requiring that at the terminus of every parking aisle, so if you have two headed parking, the, at the end of that, we're requiring a landscape medium with two landscape trees on both sides. So again, we're creating more of a, of a pattern of streets with street trees uh, within the development. So not a large sea of asphalt. We're really identifying the streets within the, the development. And so those, again, are, are critical pieces that you may not, you would not get in terms of uh, just an underlying zoning. Zoning would not dictate that you have to do those things. In, in this redevelopment plan, we are dictating those. There are a series of others, um, but those are two that I wanted to, to point out to the board. In terms of the residential track, um, the permitted uses on, in residential track are, are both the townhouses and multifamily. Uh, the townhouse being in the purple top right in the top right in the the area that, that is darker and the multi-family would be the yellow uh, in the corner. The number of units, as I indicated, would be a total of 400. Townhouses would be a maximum of 320. The multi-family would be a maximum of 80, and that represents 20%, or a minimum of 80, I apologize, a minimum of 80, which represents 20% set aside for affordable. Uh, the minimum lot size, which would be predicated on the multi-family, would be three acres. And then the lot coverage would be 75% uh, for the multifamily, 65% for the townhouses. And again, in terms of the building setbacks, there's a minimum of 35 foot uh, setback along the gross track area, a minimum of 50 foot along Kings Highway East, a minimum of 12 foot setback within the internal roads, a minimum of 12 foot along the interconnect road. Uh, bottom right image, that represents the residential track, so the interconnect road run along the bottom. So I know this is not oriented exactly the same way, but this would be the interconnect road through here, and in this map it would be through here. So the interconnect road would, would dissect the commercial track from the townhouse track, um, and, and that would be uh, that would be a defined piece of it. We, we have placed requirements on the interconnect road in terms of sidewalks, in terms of the trees, the lighting, uh, so that it functions as a public street, not just a, a concert. And the building separation from the single family zone uh, setback part of the 75 foot and the building separation would be 20 
Uh, in addition, uh, the resident track, just some, some additional uh, standards, and this really starts on page 15 of your document. Uh, the townhouses are, are uh, permitted four-story, 45-foot, multifamily, four-story, 45-foot. The clubhouse would be two stories, and any accessory buildings would be one story. Uh, and you can see the parking uh, circulation and setback requirements along the foot track would be 50 foot, the interconnect road would be 15 foot, residential buildings would be 6 foot, and non residential buildings like the clubhouse would be 10 foot. As I mentioned, uh, we walked through and starting on page uh, 19 of the document, we put in place, and these are from this, from 19, page 37 really represents a design standard that you would not typically find in a, in a zone or zoning district. And so um, I'm going to go through some of them, but I'm not going to go through all of them. So you can see the list of, of all of the identifiable components of the design standards in terms of architectural character, beam, pedestrian circulation, um, all the way to form and scale, elevations, all of those things, materials are all components of the, of the uh, design standard. What I thought I would do is, is show you some of the imagery of what is uh, what would be proposed in terms of the, the graphic. Uh, and I'm not sure if everyone can see this, but I'll, I'll kind of walk through this. So this is a, a photo taken from, uh, or image taken from Route 35 going into the main entrance. And we can see that there are large landscape areas. These would be stormwater detention bases. You can see the landscape, so you have identifiable streets within uh, the development as opposed to just asphalt in front of commercial. Uh, so so we, these are requirements as part of the, the development that simply isn't, you know, this is what we're hoping for. This is a requirement. So when the site plan application comes before the board, it has to meet the requirements that are that are identified in this report in terms of the landscape, the setbacks, all the time. Is it an image that it would, is uh, an area located at the back. Uh, there's a large public plaza so that you have retail that steps out front. So, so you have a uh, street here. This represents an outdoor pedestrian plaza. You can see that the, that the idea here is that the plaza actually becomes the more important. The pedestrian piece becomes more important. You can start to see here that this is that landscape uh, delineation between the, the different uh, areas of the parking, so that, that requirement 275 uh, spaces. This represents one of those landscapes. So this is actually a pedestrian walkway that connects uh, within and down into, into the 35. Uh, and then an image taken across so you can see some of the landscape that's required as a part of uh, the development. You can see that. When you come in there, there, is, uh, there are areas where there's shown on this is the green. That represents those 12-foot areas. Uh, so again, everything we're trying to do really represents a higher quality type of development. In terms of the architecture and the character as, as proposed in both the redevelopment plan, here are some images of some of the uh, types of buildings. It's earth tone. We have, we have a material palette uh, within the redevelopment plan. So that when the application comes in front of the board and they are proposing certain types of materials, you can look at the redevelopment plan and determine whether or not they are subsequently meeting those requirements. Um, but these are some of the images that are being proposed for the development. You can see it's a it's a variety of, of different uh, materials. You're not permitted to have just flat uh, facades. So there's undulation, uh, which creates uh, interest from an architectural standpoint. There are deviations in height, uh, so the buildings aren't just one level. Uh, so there's a, a much higher quality of, of design that has been written into the requirements in the redevelopment plan from an architectural standpoint. Just some more images of, of different proposed uh, areas. This is to be the public plaza as, as proposed. Uh, we showed you the image of that previously, and then another shot of the public plaza. And just to show you kind of where that is, in the last two images that would have been taken looking into this area, so you can start to see how you have the lineation between this parking area, this parking area, this parking area. So you can see how the, the plan really looks to create much smaller areas of parking with a lot more landscape 
uh, and a lot more buffers uh, to again you know, ensure a higher quality of uh, design. In terms of the residential concept, again, there are requirements, uh, design standard requirements for the for the residential component. Uh, I thought you know probably the easiest thing is to show you uh, one of the proposed uh, elevations. We have in the document identified how we have now, uh, you can't have uh, repeating uh, building facades of the same materials within the, the development. So you're trying to really make sure that you have uh, different character, different architecture in terms of the facade uh, materials. That you're not taking a single, uh, this would be a, you know, a Five, a five unit building and repeating that five unit building multiple times that it's going to appear as a different architectural element. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of information in this report, but I'm going, to, I'm going to, I did highlight a few things here that I thought were also important from a sustainable standpoint. Uh, the list on the top, which is, is uh, required for us, so these would be absolutely required uh, as a part of the site plan application. When it, when it, if and when it comes in, to provide grass species of drought tolerant plants, uh, to manage rain, uh, rainwater by implement, implementing detention in rain gardens, minimize disturbance and erosion, maximize uh, success of improvements, uh, low flood low toilets, uh, provide trees with landscaping requirements, full cutoff lighting uh, in primary parking areas again to limit the uh, to limit any lighting uh, noise. Or pollution to adjacent properties. Uh, that's a requirement. Efficient HVAC units, LED, LED lighting uh, for all site signage and parking lot lighting uh, to provide uh, a charging station for every 100 vehicles, one for every 300 vehicles. And then the components that uh, would be encouraged but not necessarily required uh, would be the list, uh, the list below in terms of where the materials came from, coolers, and whatnot. So, not only do you have uh, zoning, but what you have in here is, is requirements that go way beyond what zoning would typically um, require a developer to, to uh, do in order to, in order to design a development that is much more sustainable from an environmental standpoint. Like I said, there's a lot in here. I'm not going to read all this, but I just want to I highlighted a few of the things that I thought were important. There's a you know, for the residential track, a 50 foot wide buffer uh, shall be provided along the perimeter road. Uh, in terms of landscape requirements for the gross track, trees shall be planted on both sides of the interconnect road at intervals of not more than 30 foot on center. There should be uh, on the interconnect road a four foot landscape area, a four foot sidewalk minimum. Uh, shade trees uh, should be planted along all, all private internal roads. One tree every 120 foot. That's uh, that's for the gross track, and then the trees are to be three to three and a half inch caliper, uh, which which are a good size in comparison to what uh, some developers typically want to put in, which is a two and a half to three inches or three to three to five inch. So it's again uh, a higher standard. And then uh, along Kings Highway East, because I know that that is a um, that's an important uh, corridor for existing residential and existing neighborhoods. There is a seventy-five foot a minimum setback of 75 foot and parking shall be at least uh, 50 foot off of Kings Highway East. Um, and along the interconnect road, um, it says the number of trees that it, it, sh it should consist of a minimum of. Uh, no freestanding signage shall be located along 50 foot of, uh, within 50 foot of Kings Highway East. Uh, and then the commercial tract, um, <coughs> that there's additional landscaping along the north side of, of Kings Highway East closest proximity to the residential uh, with a minimum of, of the 20 uh, shade trees. That's in addition to the existing buffer that's going to be uh, kept in that area. So it's not just 20 shade trees. It's, they're going to be keeping the existing uh, the proposal and the requirement is to keep the existing uh, trees in that area and then add to it uh, to create a better buffer. And again, in terms of lighting, uh, just to hit some of the highlights that the LED fixtures are to be dark sky compliant, meaning that they, they really shield the light uh, from, from going off site. Uh, that the pedestrian lights should not be greater than 18 foot, so you're not going to get uh, these large overhead you know, lighting up. Uh, the idea here is just to limit the, uh, 
the light. And so, as I, as I indicated, I've not gone through all of the requirements, uh, but I tried to, to list to you or tell you what I thought were the most important ones and then try to show you how this redevelopment plan goes far beyond what the underlying PV zone permits uh, by requiring uh, a higher quality development both from an architectural standpoint, from a sustainable standpoint, from a landscape architectural standpoint. And so, you know, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions from the board. Thank you, Mr. Ryan, for your report. Uh, any comment on the comments from the board? Uh, yes, I have, some, I have a number of questions. Um, you've gone through a number of uh, new zoning requirements here. Those, those uh, uh, from a regular building height, Whatever and also uh, uh, architectural as well as sustainable elements. What was the process? How did you come about with these new uh, recommendations? So it's um, it's an iterative process. Uh, you know, you have the underlying PD zone as a basis that you can use. Uh, there is a developer that is been involved. And everybody knows that. Uh, part of the process was to look at the underlying PD zone, uh, look at what the developer was proposing, and then look at what is in the best interest of the township to require things that a developer might not necessarily be willing to do unless required to do. So what we did is is we uh, we looked at at those components and then put together a plan uh, based on those components. So where did you meet with the uh developer that had been working on a plan and come up with some suggestions from that developer? Did you meet with township officials to come up with uh, proposed zoning requirements? We met with, uh, we did meet with the uh, with developers uh, and we did meet with uh, the township and we did meet with some members of the public, uh, all in an effort to try and understand the various issues that everybody and concerns that everybody frankly had about property. So we, we took information from, as I mentioned, the, we did have a meeting with, public, with members of the public, we had a meeting with the municipality, and we had a meeting with the developers. And what was there, when you said you had a meeting with the public, was that, how did you select which members of the public to meet with? I, I did not. I, I, I was asked to, uh, to uh, attend a meeting, and I, and I did. Uh, members of the public were at that. And who set the meeting up? Uh, the, uh, I, met, I believe it was the uh, township attorney. Township attorney? What does the neighbors live in town? On some of the architectural challenges, the four story building, you were, I see you have to well, be flat roof. <laughs> You're introducing a uh, like a living roof, yes. like someone. I can see that in North Jersey, near the uh, you know North Jersey City, but we're architecture. We might still not care for that, be, 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 being in a more traditional area. Uh, it's a great idea. I don't know if it will work in Middletown. It's one question I have architecture. In terms of uh, whether or not you do a pitched roof versus a flat roof. Yeah, but to have a flat roof and then having a uh, having a recreational area, it's yes. interesting. I know it's been done. I don't know if it would fit into our plans, but that's again that's conjecture. Uh, once we once we see a complete site plan, which yes, that's different. The other question I have, and uh, I'm on the environmental commission commission, is that detention basin. Responsibilities of, of taking care of it by either a commercial district or the home area. Well, that would be that has to be probably shared. Would you say so? So I think that the, the final decision on that would be uh, would be identified within the redevelopers agreement with the with the redeveloper. I will say that there are requirements that uh, that even if certain portions of the open space are deeded over to the municipality, a minimum of at least 25% has to stay uh, within the, the, the 
developer. And so having said that, it seems to me that it's more likely that the developer is going to be required uh, to, to maintain that than the municipality will. Uh, but the redevelopment agreement would certainly dictate the who's responsible, what happens if one party that is responsible does not do it to a certain uh, uh, level, then the other party would, there would be, there would be methods to come in and rectify it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, just uh, for my edification, you, you had a slide up there showing the, uh, the evolution of this from 1994 to 2009 until now. Uh, and I noticed pretty quickly that the percentage of units that were uh, co-op seemed to go up. And I don't know if that, maybe, maybe everybody knows this and I just wouldn't do, but is, is that something that changed on the statutory level or is it part of the settlement in 2009? Um, I would okay. um, So uh, it was as for the uh, original settlement and we were not municipalities are uh, actually all of the 565 municipalities, only 68 municipalities have a certified core plan. We were one of those. Um, in Astra Core Plan, um, we had uh, 322, 320 market rate units and 80 uh, affordable housing units, which was a part of even the, uh, I believe the 297 units. Um, however, what uh, the, uh, the circus maker uh, plan proposes is uh, that has lowered the number of units to 320 and 70, uh, I think there's 70 opposers. So, yeah. Eight opposers. So that's as per our um, 2008 uh, housing plan and then and pressure plan, which was certified by co op. Another question. Um, under your background information section, uh, you, you said that nothing shall preclude the property owner within the redevelopment plan area from submitting an application in accordance with the underlying zone. So um, is it the case where someone, a developer, could come in and choose whether they want to go with the redevelopment process or they can go with the current PD zone process? Yes, that would be the case. So why, why would a developer want to go through the process when there's much more regulation. Yeah. You know, I, I think these questions are fair questions from the board and inquisitive in trying to figure out the process. But the determination by statute is whether or not this is a substantial conformance with the master. So, trying to understand the motivations for or the results of a particular provision within this plan. That's what the prerogative of the county committee. How does it work? How many units? Why are the signs this big versus that big? Why are the buffers this much versus that much? <clears throat> All those things are within the prerogative of the committee. And the only thing to be for this board is whether or not it's substantially consistent with the next one. So I'll leave it up to the board as that. How far do you want to go with Mr. Reiner asking and responding to questions that really go to the workings of this particular redevelopment plan, how it might play out, what motivated it, how did it get there. I understand that all those things are maybe of interest to board members. What I'm saying is statutorily, this is not relevant. Well, actually, I'm not asking that. I'm asking, what is the advantage of the developer to go through a redevelopment plan? That's not up to Mr. Reiner to answer. Yeah, well, it would be, it would be conjecture for me to answer that. I mean, I can answer that question terms of opinion, but I, I don't know that that would be the developers uh, have a sound. I don't want your personal opinion on this. I mean, there's advantages and disadvantages of going both ways. That's up for the developer to decide which one he wants to proceed on. As all you folks know, this is the fourth time, the fourth round on this project. I've been to, I myself have been to three rounds. And believe me, the planning board is going to be very, very, we'll use a jaundiced eye looking at this project. There are a lot of good things and a lot of bad things, but we really will look at it very closely. We can, I can guarantee you that. Let me have you note that also in the back of Mr. Ryan's report, which has been distributed to the public as well, um, beginning on page 37 through the next five or six pages, Mr. Weiner lists the different master plant land use issues, uh, 
talks about the different policies, talks about the uh, 2009 amendment to the master plan, the 2014 master plan reexamination report, list things in there that he found while reviewing, while preparing the redevelopment plan, things that he referenced in our existing master plan documents. Mr. Reiner is not making a conclusion as to whether or not it's substantially uh, consistent. He's leaving that to you. Those things are in his report. And then if you do have an authority to go for it from the normal plan of consent with her recommendations as well. The report by Mr. Weiner has been released to the public. Obviously, it's been introduced to the Township Committee level. It is a public document. If you then uh, want to, after this meeting, the report from your planner, accepted by the board, then it can be released as a public document as well. But within that document, I think you can see in short, uh, there's basically conclusionary you know, uh, statements made by your planner after reviewing all of this as to whether it's substantially consistent. Mr. Reiner carefully doesn't draw that conclusion. He just lists data and references within your documents to draw your attention to them so you can make that decision. And again, you're not bound by the opinion or the report of your planner, but it's there for guidance. Mr. Gorman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I actually have a question regarding page 37, which of course is specific to the consistency review. Uh, and so if I may be permitted to ask uh, uh, Mr. Reiner a uh, question to start on page 37. Now, let, let, me, let me go back. I found the uh, reference to our study uh, as our thank you for bringing the rules and regulations of the, uh, of the board adopted every year. And let me read where it says about the chair here, obviously, Mr. Ratch, and acting as the chair tonight. The chair, this, section 1, column 2, dish 2. The chair shall preside all meetings and hearings of the board. Decide all points of order and matters of procedure governing said meetings or hearings, and shall perform all the duties normally pertaining pertaining to his or her office as required by law ordinance. These rules are prevailing parliamentary practice. So, when I said before, it was the prerogative of the chair with the advice and consent, basically of the uh, board. That's not correct. It's at the prerogative of the chair. Yes, and I understood the chair to say that he did not even comment on the ordinance. That doesn't matter. Uh, to present to the Township Committee. These comments, and specifically comments regarding questions to be presented on page 37, have nothing to do with the ordinance. They have everything to do with the matter, the sole matter at hand, and the consistency review. Uh, the planning board attorney, you know, sort of uh, asked the board to focus their questions on consistency rather than design, and uh, representing members of the public. Um, I have questions regarding but he, what, what, what the presenter said was his consistency review, which is really a misstatement because all it is is a list of certain objectives that are, quote, relevant. And there are probably many and others that you could point to that go the other way. I think as and that may be charged, but it's not a public hearing. It's not a public hearing. Including it's the ones that are omitted from the list. I will not have it at this time. If you wish to come to the meeting on August, uh, on August 20th, so be it. So the planning board be accepting comments on the consistency review uh, with the master plan at that time. Uh, the planning board's action is tonight. That's right. So we should be able to comment tonight. We're here. We have a plan. Of <laughs> That's your view. Uh, and I appreciate it. Can you tell me whether or not it's part of it? As you said, discretion. And you're not prohibited by law from doing it. Is the board required? Sometimes we have to do more than what we're I'm going by law, I will not. You're not being a. So, not. Mr. Shen, when you admonish this audience. I'm not admonishing the audience, sir. When you say I am not admonishing the audience, saying, you're sir. Have a careful eye. Excuse me. Does that mean you're not going to hear from the public? Like but we will like definitely hear from the public. We will definitely hear from the public. So so I'm 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 We'll be here from the public tonight. Yeah. Tonight? If you're Can I ask, tonight? please? I'll hear you right now. You got a little heated. The full reporter only has two hands, two ears. <laughs> yeah. and it's really hard, and I understand that sometimes things get excited, but please, we all try to talk more. Do you have anything for me? Yeah. Oh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think one of the reasons there's so many folks here tonight is that at the Township Committee, 
on July 16th, there was a statement made that the public would be heard at the planning board meeting. Yes. Yes, what they said. Thank you. 
motion to pass. Yes. Yes, I have some questions. Yes, sir. Um, one of the within the master plan it talks it, 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 it begins with sections on objectives and uh, principles, assumptions, and policies. And one of the uh, objectives of the master plan is to encourage streamlining development review procedures and to the extent possible simplification of the development standards and regulations to create a more efficient process which will help in reducing development costs. I think this goes totally against that, this redevelopment plan. I don't think it, I don't think the redevelopment plan is consistent with this part of the map. Why? Because it's adding complexity. It's not simplifying. I disagree. That's okay. I'm just saying, from my point of view, I don't think it's consistent with the your point of view.